All right, hi everyone. We are starting our lectures right away. We are starting with chapter 12, Kinetics, from the second edition chemistry OpenStax textbook. So this is gonna pick up basically where everything left off from 2A. Um, this chapter on kinetics is very close to my heart because kinetics is what I basically studied in grad school, kinetics of atmospheric reactions and gas phase processes. So um, I'm very well versed in this. Um, basically I had a full textbook on kinetics, not just a chapter that I had to learn. So if you have questions, feel free to let me know. If you're a calculus person and you want to see the calculus behind a lot of this, let me know and I would be happy to go through it with you. Uh, but no, we are not doing calculus. So if you have not taken calculus, do not worry. Just take my word for it on um, what some of these formulas are. So this chapter has seven sections, but they're all relatively short. There's chemical reaction rates, factors affecting reaction rates, rate laws, integrated rate laws, collision theory, reaction mechanisms, and catalysis. So just to kind of start the chapter, we have this awesome picture of the Agama lizard um, basking in the sun. And the reason that lizards do this is because the heat from the sun uh, warms up their blood so they can move faster. So what happens, they heat up and it help, helps the chemical reactions in its body uh, make its muscles move more rapidly when it's at higher temperatures. So cold lizards are slower and easier meals for predators. So we're gonna open up with 12.1 chemical reaction rates. In this section, we are going to define chemical reaction rates derive rate expressions from the balanced equation for a given chemical reaction, and calculate reaction rates from experimental data. So chemical reactions occur at different rates, and I'm sure you guys have seen this happen. Uh, it, you know, for instance, just, you know, browning some sugar happens pretty quick, but if you want to make a full-on caramel, it might take a little bit of time. Some reactions are fast, others are slow. So chemists study the rates of reactions and we try to control these rates as well. This study of reaction rates is called kinetics. So kinetics meaning moving. So we're looking at how things move. The rate of reaction is the change in the amount of reactant or product per unit of time. Okay, so for my calculus people, you could think of this as 10 going, you know, D reactant DT, or delta reactant over delta T. Um, most often you will see the amount in terms of concentration. And so we look at concentration by using those brackets that you just saw me write down for the R's. Um, that represents concentration generally in molarity. So a rate itself is also a measure of how a property varies with time. The rate of reaction then is the amount of something over time. We can write rate expressions to give a mathematical representation of a rate of reaction. And we're going to look at some of those. So before we start looking at some examples, reaction rates themselves are always positive quantities. So overall, a reaction rate is positive. The concentration itself is generally expressed in molarity. And the rate expressions can be written in terms of reactant or product concentration. So we're gonna look at how to do that. So let's look at this reaction as an example. We have 2N2O5 becoming 4NO2 plus O2. So we can write rate expressions for each species. So the rate of decomposition of N2O5, it's going down in time. So we would say that the rate, it has a negative change in, in concentration. 
So we say it has a negative here. And the change in concentration, we have some concentration of N2O5 at time two. So this is the last time. Um, subtract our initial time of N2O5 at some time one. And this is divided by the actual time two minus time one. And my cats are making messes, cool. So this we can rewrite as saying it's negative delta H2O2, or sorry, not H2O2, N2O5. Let me just erase this now that you've seen it. Save some room. So this is negative delta H2O2, or I keep doing that, N2O5. over delta t. So that is the rate of decomposition. So decomposition, that means it's going away over time. So it has a negative rate of decomposition. It's going away, so it has a negative slope. Whereas the NO2 formation and the O2 formation are going to be positive because they are forming over time. So the rate of NO2 is going to equal to delta NO2 over delta t. And oxygen is going to be delta O2 over delta T. For my calculus people, you could also consider these as like D oxygen DT. Um, if you were to be taking like chemical engineering kinetics, you would then do integrations and all kinds of fun stuff with it. But we're not doing chemical engineering kinetics. Um, this is another example. This is looking at the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. So this is 2H2O2 aqueous becoming 2H2O liquid plus O2 gas. And what they did here is show us uh, the change in H2O2 from point from each point at which they took measurements. So between time one, two, three, four, and five. Between times one and two, our change in H2O2, it went down, was negative 0.5 molar, and that delta T is six hours. That's how much time elapsed. So then we do negative 0.5 divided by six. It's negative, negative 0.5, because remember the whole thing is, has that negative in front of it. And so then that gives us this rate of decomposition of 0 0.0833 moles per liter per hour. And you can also see that the rate of decomposition is changing over time. It's slowing down because we're getting a lower concentration of H2O2 or hydrogen peroxide. So, the, so it's going to decompose less because you're not getting as many collisions happening to make a successful reaction. These points that we just calculated, these are actually called average reaction rates. So this is the rate at which a reaction proceeds over a time period. So if we look back here, this was a six hour time period. So over that course of six hours between each of the two points that we measured, six hours had progressed. So that's why these are average reaction rates for each of those six hour periods. Now we also have instantaneous reaction rates. And so this is the reaction rate at a specific time and or concentration. So you use this, you have a graph where you have your concentration on the y-axis, time on the x-axis, and you usually have some type of kind of curved line. And the instantaneous rate, for instance, if we wanted to figure it out at this point on the line, we need to take the slope of that point on the line. So this is more of a calculus type thing. Um, so you figure out the slope of that line, and then that is how you can get your instantaneous reaction rate. That is your reaction rate at that time. And then your initial reaction rate is the instantaneous rate at time zero. So if this is our time zero right here, our instantaneous reaction rate is the slope at that point. Here's a lot prettier graph than what I tried to draw. So it shows you the different 
uh, types of reaction rates. So up here at the top left, there's our instantaneous reaction rate. This is time zero. So the slope of this is the initial rate that initial the initial rate that instantaneous initial rate. This point lower on the graph. This is the instantaneous rate at 12 hours. See the line that is running tangent to our graph. So these are tangential curve lines that on the curve. So there's one for every point. This is very calculus heavy. We're not gonna go into how you do it or why or what, but this is what it means, okay? To go over an example of where you might see reaction rates um, outside of the lab, um, test strips that are used for urinalysis. Um, they, for instance, can test for glucose um, using a couple different reactions. Um, and you actually, it's actually very important that these test strips be read at the right time because if they are read too early, you might get a false neg negative, whereas if you wait too long, you might get a false positive because another slower reaction might take place. So um, if any of you keep fish tanks, there's even test strips for the fish tank that you can dip in to see um, some of your chemical levels, but they're actually not very accurate. And a lot of it has to do with things like the reaction rates because you know you wait one second too much and you may not, your reaction may be too far gone and it might give you a higher uh, reading than what you should have. Okay, so let's talk about the relative rates of reaction. So the way a reaction is expressed can be done so by looking at the change in concentration of any reactant or product. And a lot of times we use stoichiometric factors derived from the balanced equation to relate reaction rates of all the different parts of a reaction. For instance, if we have some AA becoming BB, the rate of the reaction, we could say it's either equal to the decomposition of A, which is negative chain, uh, oops, one over A times the concentration of A Delta, oops, delta concentration of A over delta T. We could also say though that the rate is equal to one over B times the change in concentration of B delta T. So stoichiometry is what relates our uh, size of the reaction. So for instance, if we have two NH3, and that is decomposing to form N2 plus three H2. And I wanna compare the rate of decomposition of ammonia to the rate of formation of nitrogen. I know that my change in moles of ammonia over time And I all um, that it's change if we're relating this to nitrogen. I also know that I need I make one mole of nitrogen for every two moles of NH3, and that gets me my change in moles of nitrogen uh, over time. So we can just kind of simplify this down, and we could say it's negative one half delta moles of ammonia. over delta T. Oops. And that is equal to delta moles of N2 over delta T. And then if we were instead to use concentration instead of just moles, which is more common to do, we would have negative one half delta concentration of ammonia, delta T is equal to delta N2, delta T. 
So that would be our final form relating these two. So here is a graph showing the ammonia decomposing while the hydrogen and the nitrogen are forming over time. And so we can find the rate of change of their concentrations uh, by looking at the slopes at instantaneous moments that we decide. Um, here the, they focus on the tangent lines at t equals 500 seconds. So that's where they were looking at some instantaneous rates for all three of our um, compounds. And if we were to compare uh, the hydrogen to the nitrogen. So for hydrogen and nitrogen, we know that the formation of hydrogen, since it has a three in front of it, then is going to be one third delta H2 over delta T. And that was equal to delta N2 over delta T. So, and if we were to look at these instantaneous slopes for hydrogen, we have 2.91 times 10 to the negative six molar per second, moles per liter per second. And if we divide that by the rate of nitrogen at this point, 9.70 times 10 to the negative seventh molar per second, we get about three, which makes sense. That matches our balanced equation. The hydrogen is forming three times as fast as the nitrogen. If we wanted to relate the hydrogen to the nitrogen from the balanced equation, we would say that one half delta N2 or NH3, not N2, sorry, delta T is equal to one third delta H2 delta t. And this is also seen if you compare the two slopes, 2.91 times 10 to the negative 6 divided by 1.94 times 10 to the negative 6, you get 1.5, 3 halves, which relates their stoichiometry. Three hydrogen made for every two ammonia, 1.5 or 3 halves. All right, so let's go ahead and look at a couple examples. Starting with example 12.1, we're told the first step in the production of nitric acid is the combustion of ammonia, and given the balanced reaction you see there. And then we're told to write the equations that relate the rates of consumption of the reactants and the rates of formation of the products. So here it just wants us to go ahead and write the relative reaction rates for everything and relate them. So we know for our reactants, we have ammonia and oxygen, that they are going to be negative because they're being consumed. For ammonia, it has that four in front of it. So it'd be a negative one fourth times the change in concentration of ammonia. Oops. Over delta T. And that is equal to negative one fifth, since that's what's in front of the oxygen. O2 over delta T. So there's our reactants that are going away. And our products that are forming, we have one fourth the change in concentration of NO divided by change in time. And that's also equal to one sixth delta H2O delta T. And so that's literally all this question was asking. Our next example refers back to the graph we looked at um, for the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. And we're also already given the equation here, 2H2O2 becomes 2H2O plus O2. 
and we're said based on these data, the instantaneous rate of decomposition of hydrogen peroxide at T equals 11.1 .1 hours is determined to be 3.20 times 10 to the negative second moles per liter per hour. And then they rewrote it in terms of delta peroxide over delta T. And we want to use this to find the instantaneous rate of production of water and oxygen. So we know that the rate of decomposition of water is going to be, or of peroxide, is negative one half delta H2O2 over delta T. And we know that that is equal to one half times the production of water over delta T. And that is equal to just one in front of the oxygen, one over one, so delta oxygen over delta T. So here we're just solving for delta water over delta T and delta oxygen over delta T. So we're looking at that instantaneous rate. So we're not looking for a concentration, we're just looking for a rate. Start off. Let's go ahead and figure some things out. The one thing that you might notice first off is that the rate of production of water is the same as the rate of decomposition of H2O2. Negative one half times H2O2 is equal to one half times H2O2. So those one halves cancel out. So we know that delta H2O delta T is equal to 3.20 times 10 to the negative second moles per liter per hour. So water's done. That was nice and easy. Now to do H2O2 to oxygen, okay, we know then if we're solving for delta oxygen delta T, it's equal to negative one half the rate of peroxide. So that means that delta oxygen over delta T is equal to one half times 3.20 times 10 to the negative second. So this is 1.60 times 10 to the negative second moles per liter per hour. So there's our two instantaneous rates of production. Notice I got rid of that negative sign um, on the H2O2 um, for because remember rates are positive things. You can't have a negative rate. Um, so we're just looking at the instantaneous rate of production. It's just going to be half the rate of the other one. We don't need to worry about that negative sign there. 